Okay, today we're going to talk about circles in the coordinate plane. Most specifically, we're going to talk about how to write equations of circles. So that's your essential question. What is the equation of a circle? With center HK, so H is like your X coordinate and K is your Y coordinate. And radius R, so R is going to be some length of the radius in the coordinate plane. So we're going to do a little um, deriving of the equation of a circle. So for the standard equation of a circle, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem to derive the standard equation. And really, there's just one way of looking at the standard equation, but in, order, in an effort to help us with this, I've given us a really simple example, and then we'll build on that. So this is a circle centered at the origin. The origin is basically where the x and the y axis meet. And the coordinates of the origin are always 0, 0. So this point right here is 0, 0. In other words, the center, you can think of this as like the standard graph of a circle in the coordinate plane. The center of it is at the origin. Okay? There will be other circles that get translated, so they move, right? They move in the coordinate plane. So like this one here, notice it's not centered at the, at the center. Right, the center is actually has been translated, it's been moved to the right h units and up k units. And I'm not sure what h and k are, they're just some numbers. Let's start with the easy one though. So with this circle, centered at the origin, I can easily draw a radius. So I just go from the center of the circle to a point on the circle, and I draw this radius. And if I take that radius then from the point that it makes on the circle, and I draw a vertical line, that line there is going to be a leg of a right triangle, and that leg is going to have a height of y, right? And then this bottom leg, if I connect it to finish off my right triangle, this bottom leg will have a length of x. Pretty straightforward. Now I can use the Pythagorean theorem to relate x, y, and r. Remember, Pythagorean theorem is a leg squared plus a leg squared equals a hypotenuse squared. So one of my legs is x, so x squared, plus the other leg, which is y, y squared, is equal to r squared. Now let's expand upon that. Usually your circle is not going to be nice and centered at the origin. It's going to have been translated somewhere else in the coordinate plane. So once again, this circle, if we think about the original one being at the origin, it's been translated to the right h units, right, that x coordinate, and up k units, this k, this y coordinate. Now that's where my center has been translated to. So now if I draw my radius from hk to the outside of the circle, this height and this length of this le of these different legs they're based off of what the center is, right? So if this value here at the center, if the y value is k, think of this height then goes from whatever the y value is down to k. So the height here is going to be y minus k. And the same is true now for this bottom leg, this horizontal leg. Think about this point right here. Right, this is some x value. Well, the length of this leg, this horizontal leg, goes from x back to h. We're just finding the distance of a horizontal line. We just found the distance of a vertical line. Okay, so using the Pythagorean theorem, we now get x minus h squared, right? That's one of my legs. Plus my other leg, well, that length of that leg is now y minus k. And that's going to equal your radius squared. 
So this right here is the equation that I want you to think about or use no matter what, because this will even be applied to this one. It just so happens that my center is 0, 0. So if I plug 0 in for h and 0 in for k, I get that. So this right here is the standard equation for any circle centered anywhere in the coordinate plane. This is the one that you need to remember. And remember, it's centered, let me highlight this actually, circle centered at hk, where h is some x value and k is some y value. All right, so let's figure this out. All right, so for A, we're going to write the standard equation of a circle. Now for A, we've been given the graph. So the first thing we have to do is we have to find the center. And maybe you can visualize it, or maybe you can't. If you can't visualize it, what you want to do is you want to find the most extreme points on this circle. So like my highest and my lowest point. So my highest point on the y-axis is 8, and my lowest point on the y-axis is 0. So if I want to find the midpoint there, remember what you do? You basically average the two values. So on the y-axis, it would be like y2 plus y1 divided by 2. Well, this one's 8. This one's 0. So 8 plus 0 is 8 divided by 2 is going to give me 4. Okay, so the y value, I'll go ahead and just write my coordinates here, is going to be 4. And now let's do the same thing for the x values. So find like the fattest point, the most extreme points on this circle, okay, which is basically, uh, I think that's negative 9, and this one is negative 1. Well, averaging negative 9 and negative 1, that's just... Right, so same thing for the x values. Instead of using the y's here, I would just use the x's and average them. So negative 9 plus negative 1 is negative 10. Divide that by 2, you get negative 5. So I know that my midpoint is at negative 5, 4. Or sorry, my center, <laughs> which is comprised of the midpoints of the highs and the lows on the y-axis and the highs and the lows on the x-axis. Well, this gives me my h and my k. The only other thing I need now is my radius. And you can get that by either drawing a horizontal line or a vertical line. Don't go diagonal because you're going to have to then do some math to try and figure out what the length of that is, right? You'd have to actually figure out what the the length and the height are going to the point where that radius is. So instead, use either a vertical line from the center to the outside of a radius of the circle or a horizontal line. Either way, these are going to be the same. Right? So from negative uh, 5 to negative 1, well, that's a length of 4. Or from 4 up to 8, that's also a length of 4. So my radius here is 4. So now what I'll do using that general standard form of an circle of, it, of an equation of a circle, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared. And I encourage you to write this out until you have it completely memorized. You're going to use things like this over and over and over as you get into Algebra 2 and beyond. All right, so all I'm going to do now is plug in my h, my k, and my r. So this is x minus negative 5 that quantity squared, plus y minus 4, that quantity squared, equals, and then my radius squared. And we'll do a little simplifying. So this is actually x plus 5 squared plus y minus 4 squared equals 16. So there's the equation of this circle. Now they're not going to give us a picture. They're going to expect us to just be able to read this and figure it out from there. So we've got a circle with center at the origin. Well, that's cool. So I know that my center is at 0, 0. 
So that's my H and my K. And I also know my radius is 2.5, so that's my R. So once again, using this standard equation of a circle, and again, I encourage you to write it out until you've got it completely memorized. The more you write it out, the more the easier it's going to be to, um, to memorize. Okay, so we're going to have x minus 0 squared plus y minus 0 squared equals 2.5 squared. Well, x minus 0 is just x. y uh, minus 0 is just y, so that's y squared. 2.5 times 2.5 is 6.25. So there's the equation of the circle that's being described. All right, the point 0.41 is on a circle with center at 1, 4. Write the standard equation of the circle. So once again, that's x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. Okay, so we got to figure out what h and k are. Well, that's pretty easy because it tells me that my center is at 1, 4. So I know that h is 1 and k is 4. The other thing I need to know, though, is my radius. Nobody told me what my radius is, but I need to figure it out. Again, I know that the center of the circle is at 1, 4, and I know that this is a point on the circle. So what I need to do with these two points is I need to find the distance. The distance between these two points is going to equal my radius. All right, so let's figure out my radius. Let's see. How about if I call this one x1, y1? And this one, x2, y2. And we'll just use the distance formula. So x2 is 1 minus x1, which is 4. Square that quantity. Plus, and then y2 is 4. y1 is 1. And square that quantity. So my the length of my radius is really 1 minus 4, which is negative 3. We'll square that. 4 minus 1 is 3. We'll square that. So I'm going to have the square root of 9 plus 9, which is the square root of 18. I'm not going to simplify that, and I'll show you why in a second. So I'm just going to leave it exactly as it is. So now I know my radius. I know my h. I know my k. I'm ready to go ahead and make the standard equation of the circle. All right, so we're going to go x minus h. Well, h is 1. Square that. y minus k. k is 4. Square that. And then my radius is square root of 18, and I'm going to square that. Well, what happens when you square a square root? These two undo each other, right? The square root and the square are inverses of each other, so they undo each other. So really all I'm left with here is x minus 1 squared plus y minus 4 squared equals, and that's just 18. And there's the equation of that circle. All right, so now we're going to do a little bit of review of something that you probably learned about in Algebra 1. I know it's been a little while, so we're going to review this, um, and we're going to then apply it in our next lesson to actually coming up with equations of circles. But before we can do that, you got to practice this. You have to know how to complete the square. Before I begin, I'm going to show you an example using... Um, this like interactive build your model for a quadratic. So I'm going to complete the square on this quadratic here, x squared plus 4x. And notice I've got some tiles here. So one of them is an x squared. That means it's x length by x height. This one is x. So basically the area is x. So it's x length by a height of 1. So when you multiply those, you get x. And this is an area of 1, so height of 1, or sorry, base of 1, or length, and then a height of 1, which when you multiply, you get 1. Okay? So these are like area models. 
Now I'm going to put in x squared plus 4x here. So I'm going to pick an x squared. And then I'm going to put 4x's in here as well. And what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and complete the square. Completing the square, if you think about it geometrically with this, is to really just build a model that is a square. So both the base and the height or the length and the width are equal lengths. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and line these up. So I can put this tile here because these both have a length of x. So x length matches up with the x length of this green tile. Okay, I can put another one here. Let's see, and these can also be turned. So let's see, what if I turn that one? And how about if I'll turn that one? Let's see, let's play around with these. So if I line this up here, so that my x lengths are matching up, so now I've got this length of x here plus two singles here. So this would be an x plus two. And on this side, the same thing. So I have a length of x here, and I have two singles here. So the length here would be x plus 2. So I've got an x plus 2 and an x plus 2. But my model is not complete. I need to make this so that it actually is built up as a square. So I am missing some pieces here that would finish or that would complete the square, would complete making this whole model into a square. Can you see what that is? Can you see what I'm missing? So this would be a one by one space, right? So that was a square that it has an area of one. So I'm going to pull one of those over. And I got another one here. I got another one here. So really what I've just added here to this, if I add four, that makes this a perfect square trinomial. x squared plus 4x plus 4 can then be factored to be x plus 2 on this side, x plus 2 on this side, and when you multiply those together, you will in fact get the x squared plus the four x's, these four green ones, plus the four ones or the four yellow ones. So really I could rewrite this as x plus 2 to the second power because both dimensions, height and width, or length and height, or however you want to describe that, are x plus 2. That's like a visual model of what completing the square is. Now let's actually apply that. All right, so we are going to be completing the square, and this will eventually help us create or write more equations of circles. Okay, so. We have this quadratic equation. Quadratic, I know it's quadratic because it's an x squared. That's my leading term. Now, quadratic equations, if you write them in standard form, we write them as ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. That's the standard form of a quadratic equation. Now, when we're completing the square, there's a few things that are really, really, really important. The first thing. The first step, I should say, is to always make sure that your a is equal to 1. So a must equal 1. Now, if I look at this equation here, my a actually does equal 1. There's nothing there, so that's a 1. Great. The next step, and you can see that they've done that here, is that you want your a and your b terms alone. So you're going to move your C term or your constant, that's the term that has no variable, you're going to move that C term over to the other side. So what it was here, it was negative. They basically added 3 to both sides, which moved it over here. So second term is to always move C to other side. Okay, so next, let's see what they do next here. Okay, they're adding 4 squared to both sides. 
Why are they doing that? Well, that's our third step, okay? So you're always going to add something to both sides. So the, so the third step is you're going to add, and this 4 came from taking B and dividing it by 2. Okay, so that's where the 4 came from. So you always take B, you divide it by 2, and then you square it. So you always add B over 2 squared to both sides. Okay, so that's what they did here. They took 8, they divided it by 2, that gave them 4, they squared it and added it to both sides. And it says that right here, 8 divided by 2 squared or 4 squared. Okay, next step. And the steps are all written right here as well. The fourth step here, you basically now want to take the left-hand side, and you write it as the square of a binomial. So you basically take this first term and this last term, you take the square root of them, so x and 4, and you write it as a binomial squared because x plus 4 times x plus 4 is in fact x squared plus 8x plus 4 squared. Right? Let's just review that. So x plus 4 times x plus 4. Right, if you do first, you're going to get x squared. Outers, you're going to get 4x. Inners, you're also going to get 4x. Last, you're going to get 16. And notice the inners and the outers combine. They're exactly the same, right? So you're just doubling it. So this is x squared plus 8x plus 16. Which means if I have this, I can rewrite it like this, or the better version of that, is x plus 4 squared. Okay, so step 4, actually I think I'm just going to go ahead and continue my steps right here. Right, the left side is the square of a binomial. Okay, then you're going to solve. So if you take the square root of each side, this is the same thing as solving. So that's your next step. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to take the square root to solve, which also means subtract 4 from each side. So you basically when you're here, right, once you take the square root of both sides here, you get rid of that square sign. So you're just left with x plus 4. And then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to get x by itself, so you got to subtract the 4. Okay, so let's actually do one, or how about we do two of these together? So let's do number 10. That way we can have a little bit more practice. So number 10. P squared plus 10P minus 4 equals 0. Step 1. Make sure that A equals 1. Yep, my A is in fact 1. Right? There's nothing in front of P. Okay. Step 2. Move C to the other side. Well, right now my C is negative 4. How do I move that to the other side? I add 4 to both sides. Okay, next step. Now you're going to take B, divide it by 2, square, and add that to both sides. Okay, so my B is 10. I'm going to divide that by 2. And I'm going to square it. I'm going to add that to both sides. Okay, so I added it to the left. I'm going to do that same exact thing over on the right-hand side. Now I'll go ahead and I'll simplify. And instead of writing this, I'm not going to rewrite this as 25. That really is 5 squared, which is 25. I'm going to write it as 5 squared. It's going to make it a little bit easier to make that the square of a binomial. Just like they did here, right? They didn't write that as 16. They left it as 4 squared. So this is plus or equals 4 plus 5 squared. Okay, this left-hand side now, 
we're on step four, we need to write the left side as a square of a binomial. So it is some binomial squared. And the way that you figure out what it is, is you basically take the square root of p squared, which is p, take the square root of 5 squared, which is 5. And then you take the sign that is in front of the middle term. Because remember, when you multiply this back out, that middle term comes from these inners and outers. And so those two signs right there are what's going to determine the sign of your middle term. So if this is positive, then that means that that had to be positive because both the inners and the outers gave us positive numbers. So P plus 5. Okay, so that's where that comes from. Now on the right-hand side, I'll go ahead and simplify. That's 25 plus 4, that's 20, 29. Okay, on to the next step. Take the square root of each side. And really what I mean by that is solve. So I'm kind of like linking these two things together. So we'll take the square root and then we'll solve. Okay, so I'm going to square root both sides. So if I take the square root of this side, well, the square root of a square, those undo each other. And if I take the square root of this side, I'm actually going to get positive or negative square root of 29. Now, why am I getting two answers? We've been over this before. But you have to remember, like if I gave you, for example, x equals 25. Oops, sorry, x squared equals 25. What number can I square to get 25? Well, I can square 5. But what else can I square? I can square negative 5. So there are actually two things that I can square to get 25. So that's why you have to say one of them is going to be positive that I can square to get 25. One of them is going to be negative. Same here, positive and negative square root of 29. And then the last thing to do is to get P by itself. So we subtract 5 from both sides. So I got P equals negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 29. I have just solved this using completing the square. Now let's also do 12. The reason I'm choosing to also do 12 with you, notice the first part here, A always has to equal positive 1. Well, A does not equal positive 1 here. C's already moved to the other side, that's pretty cool. But A doesn't equal positive 1. Okay, so let's work on that. So number 12. I think I'm going to put a line here so that we can see our different work. So I got negative z squared plus 2z equals 1. All right, so the first thing I have to do here is I have to make sure that a equals negative 1. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is to divide out this negative 1 that's being multiplied to z squared. So I'm going to divide both sides by negative 1. That's basically going to make everything the opposite sign of what it currently is. So now I got z squared minus 2z equals negative 1. Okay, now c has already been moved to the other side, right? I don't have a c here, I just have a, a and b terms. Great. Next one, add b over 2 squared to both sides. Well, my b here is 2. It's really negative 2, but when I square anything, it becomes positive. So I'm not going to worry too much about the sign of this because it's going to become positive no matter what. So z squared minus 2z, and I'm now going to add 2 over 2 squared. I added it to the left. I'm going to do the exact same thing on the right. Add 2 over 2 squared. Again, I'm not making it a negative 2 because if I square that, it just becomes positive. You can do that if you want. It's just more um, signs in there that might get confusing. All right, let me simplify. So I got z squared minus 2z. Again, I'm just going to make this a 1 squared. The reason I leave it as a square is because by taking the square root of both the first and the last term, it tells me exactly what to put into my binomial. I'm squaring a binomial, and the way I'm doing that is I'm getting the square root of the first term, which is z, and the square root of the last term, which is 1. 
Now, when I do my inners and outers, if I multiply this out, I need to end up with a negative. And the only way I'm going to do that is if this is z minus 1 squared. And if you don't believe me, then go back and do like what I did here. Multiply it out. I promise you, you'll see that the negative, both inners and outers, need negative values in order to have a negative middle term. And then over here, it's going to be negative 1 plus 1 squared, or that's just going to be 0. All right, so now I'm, uh, I already wrote the left side as the square of a binomial. It's time to solve, okay? So I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So I get z minus 1, right, because taking the, Square root of a square gives us basically those two undo each other, they're inverses. Now the square root of zero, there's really just one number that you can square to get zero, and that's zero. So there's not going to be two answers here, just one. Solve for z. I get z equals one. And we will stop here for today.